Hello everybody. So um, in this video, I would like to talk about integrating agroforestry into market gardens. And I'll take the opportunity to do so um, before then um, going on to um, discussing our own design for the market garden that we're setting up in Florence in 2023, which will have production of fruit, both um, soft fruit and top fruit, and also biomass and medicinal herbs and uh, vegetables, obviously. Um, so before we do that, I would like to introduce uh, the concept of agroforestry and see how it can be adapted to market garden scenarios, because this is not obvious and it's actually very uncommon. There's very little data and, um, and um, evidence of how these things can work together in an efficient way. Uh, so what is agroforestry first? So this is one of my favorite definitions of agroforestry because it's very comprehensive. Um, it's a land use system or it's a collective name for land use systems and technologies which include woody perennials that would be trees shrubs palms bamboos and other things which are woody but not necessarily trees um, in which these are deliberately used on the same land management units on the same field on the same garden as agricultural crops or horticultural crops i will add uh, and, and or animals in some form of spatial and temporal sequence so you can already see that there is a diversity of species uh, and types of plants. So you have herbaceous, things that do not have any wood, but also woody crops, uh, things that can produce different things. Uh, they are managed deliberately on the same land and potentially also with the inclusion of animals. And we'll see how that happens as well. And uh, But the one of the most important things is that these systems are not only spatial, they don't only evolve in time and in space, but also in time. So they're four dimensional. They've got surface element, but they've also got a height element in terms of the tree the trees that gradually incrementally grow every year, unlike vegetables, which are replanted every year. And so they never reach a very high height apart from climbers. But again, those get drawn down every year. Um, and then you have also temporal sequence. So succession, as we'll see in a minute, is very crucial because you have to plan not only in, in time within a year but also in time within multiple years different types of crops uh, and, uh, and plants in these systems have got different lifespans okay so there are obviously a lot of benefits to agroforestry and i'm not going to discuss these or give you a lot of evidence because it's, it's all over the place um, you know there is still some discussion of whether it's efficient but there are definitely some uh, some benefits and uh, and you will um, if you if you explore in your own time um, and do your own research, both by going and visiting in person agroforestry systems, but also by looking online and on books, you'll see that the benefits are very clear when compared to normal agricultural conventional systems. Um, so obviously there is increased productivity, which is a huge benefit if we want to encourage people to take on agroforestry systems and design more. Very diversified production, not only in terms of the species of the plants and also the habitat for wildlife, but also in terms of the crops and the markets that you can access. You can produce fruit, timber, fiber, um, wood chip or biomass, uh, so fuel, uh, vegetable crops, arable crops, animals, eggs. You can produce a lot of things in the same system on a very small land base by using the synergies between these. And this gives the systems also ecological resilience, uh, which means that you have... Uh, um, you are mimicking a natural ecosystem uh, in your garden or in your field or in your uh, farm and therefore you are um, benefiting from all those uh, processes that nature has developed over millions of years uh, to make its systems resilient uh, to stress so resistant to stress and able to bounce back after all types of disturbances and then obviously there's an argument i'll show you a, 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 um, a graph in a minute that these systems can cycle or store medium and short term carbon very effectively and what um, interests us in particular is also that agroforestry systems offer us the opportunity to design things holistically a system which um, involves not only different types of crops and different types of wildlife different types of microbial life different types of production of food different types of nutrition um, that can um, provide different inputs for several types of diets a complete diet but also to the human element we are not only the users or the designers of these systems but we go back to our ecological role in nature we would be cyclers we would be recyclers of biomass we would be harvesting pruning uh, disturbing and and therefore we can go back to doing that in a system like this because it's very much resembles the systems in which we've evolved like savannas or forest and um, uh, this is a just one of very many um, studies that show that carbon storage in, in uh, agroforestry systems uh, is very much improved compared to agricultural land. Um, so here they compare native forest to agricultural land, 
to 15 year old uh, indigenous agroforestry practices. And you can see in this um, right hand side graph that agricultural land doesn't store um, much uh, carbon compared to natural forest and also agroforestry systems with the ben added benefit or bonus that the agroforestry systems also produced crops as opposed to natural forests. So very close carbon storage capacity, but also productivity for human consumption. So main categories of agroforestry in the mainstream narrative, <laughs> to use a term that's been misused often, um, uh, come under four, usually three categories actually, but I'm going to add a fourth one, which um, I'll explain in a minute. Survivable systems are the ones where you have tree crops and in between you have, not, not necessarily in between, but it's essentially at the same time in the same space, you have arable crops. By arable crops, I mean field scale crops such as um, cereals, um, legumes, anything that's managed with a tractor and not in a bed system, but in a large scale mechanized often system. Then you have silver pastoral systems where you have grazing or browsing of animals in a forested environment or in an alley um, agroforestry system. And then you have the integration of these two agro silver pastoral systems. And these types of systems are actually um, usually rot rotational. You know, there's a time element to this. Obviously, you have an arable crop and then you might have animals and then you might have a cover crop or in a different uh, order. And you have tree system on the side. And then you have silver horticultural um, systems, which are the ones that, are, that we're going to be interested in, which are essentially like silvarable systems, but more on a horticultural scale. So systems which are not um, uh, concerned with uh, large scale mechanized crops, but with high value, um, um, high density um, planting systems um, in beds, um, preferably no till or minimum till beds in which there's a, a, a large um, amount of uh, biodiversity and, um, and organic matter, but also um, which are often managed by hand uh, on a smaller scale, or at least the, the modular unit, which can get then repeated as much as we want, is a small scale one. And you can see here an alley cropping system in a syntropic um, agroforestry uh, market garden, which are, <coughs> apologies, I will discuss later. But essentially, I, I, you know, I like to call this autoforestation, um, um, but it can be called anyway, silver horticultural, it can be called silvarable, but it's more concerned with vegetable crops in a small scale, high density, biointensive scenario. Um, all of this, obviously, it's organic. I'm, all, I'm only concerned with organic and regenerative practices here. I'm not going to repeat it very often. Agroforestry is very suitable for regenerative practices. Um, I have other videos on this channel about regenerative agriculture, so make sure you have a look at those if you're interested. But uh, otherwise, I'm going to take for granted that we're talking about regenerative, uh, at least organic uh, agriculture here. Right, so types of autoforestation, types of silver horticultural, small scale integration of trees, tree crops, perennial crops, shrub crops, and vegetables. Um, so I'm going to go through a few examples of things that uh, have been an inspiration for us and that um, are from which we've taken, uh, borrowed, and adapted uh, features for our final design, which is not final, in, you know, final is the wrong word, but it's our design at the moment. Um, so we'll talk about food forest in the or English forest gardens, which are typical in permaculture, indigenous forest gardens and cultura promiscua, which are which is a, which are two ancient forms of agroforestry, and then alley cropping, which is the one we've just seen in the silvarable case, but it can be also adapted to vegetables. And finally, syntropic agroforestry, which is very innovative and very very regenerative and um, natural mimicking a type of agroforestry system. Um, this uh, drawing here wants to remind us that there is no one right solution. In nature in general and in, in agriculture, there's no recipe that applies everywhere. Everything is context dependent, which means climate, soil, um, cultural, etc. dependent. It depends on so many things. Uh, so we cannot say that any of these is better than the other unless we specify the context. Also, we are going to adapt features from all of these systems to our context but this doesn't mean that it will apply very well to your context so i'm, I'm going to try to give you the the thought the mindset uh, the thinking behind all of these choices all of these ideas so that you could potentially adapt them to your own system and make your your own idea um, make, make you know make up your mind whether you want one thing or the other and whether in your context it would be more beneficial to do things this way or that um, two main concepts i'm not going to spend ages on this because you can find a lot of content on this in books and videos 
but all of these systems will have these two things in common. Uh, and forest garden, which is the smaller scale, more informal, natural looking type of agroforestry, which we'll see in a minute in real photos, um, real life examples, um, is very well known for using these two concepts. The first one is the layering or stratification that's typical of a forest applied to a garden. So you have tall trees, fruit trees or medium medium height trees, and then you have shrubs and then you have herbaceous plants and then you have your root crops or ground cover. Uh, layers and herbaceous or can be perennials or annuals can be vegetables can be root crops also the roots can be perennial or not um, and the idea of layering is that you mimic a forest you create a lot of microclimates you also deal with the light in different ways you harvest light at different from different angles you create a shade when you want it and how you want it potentially and you also produce a different height so you're using the third dimension to stack your crops uh, and then you have the idea of a guild on the right hand side which stacks not only space and time, but also stacks functions. So you have um, a unit that can be uh, either in a linear form or you can be in, a, in any type of natural looking pattern. And this linear, sorry, this uh, unit is called a guild because it, each plant um, has a different role, essentially. There is a bit of a redundancy, so several plants can have the same role, but all of the roles that you would need would be represented in this guild. In this case, you have a pitch tree, and then you have a lot of different plants that do different things. You have some flowers for attracting pollinators, some plants for pest deterrents like daffodils or garlic and things like that. You have rhubarb for as a crop uh, in the shade, you have strawberries as a crop on the ground, you have thyme as a crop on the boundaries where there's more light. Obviously peach is a shade element but it's also food, habitat and other things. Uh, you have nitrogen fixing plants, you have um, shrubs that produce fruit like um, red currant, etc, etc, etc. So in this guild you have different functions represented by different elements of different uh, heights and different strata or layers. Um, I, don't, I do want to remind you that an incredibly important element here is the synergy that happens over time uh, due to management. Whenever we harvest things, whenever we prune things, whenever we disturb the ground or an animal disturbs the ground, there is a synergy, a potential synergy between things. Um, I've discussed about this uh, pulse effect in the past, so I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but it is important that we consider also the fact that if you leave the system to its own devices and you leave it to evolve naturally it will become less productive in a certain way or more productive in another way depending on what you want but if you keep disturbing it strategically you can make it produce the way you want it and the things you want it so this element is not present necessarily in forest gardens but we will um, touch upon it and we'll, it was it will essentially be an additional element to these two in the syntropic uh, scenario successional scenario indigenous forest gardens so i want to just briefly say that this is not an idea that is new. Uh, we haven't invented anything as um, Western societies. Uh, uh, if anything, uh, this was done much better in a, in a more uh, in, on a much much larger scale. Even though it was done in, a, in small units in many cultures across the globe. Uh, here you see South American agroforestry systems, um, very highly high density, very stratified, and also very successional. People would be pruning all the time. Uh, in these systems and also they would be interacting with the forest in a way that we'll see in the second part of this of this presentation of this video um, here you see also another south american case and you see how the houses are embedded within the forest and the forest is a garden and everything is working together it's beautiful to see very natural looking but also very productive and very diversified and, and regenerative here you see a chinese plantation with i think it's tea on the on the ground um, and then you have a lot of tree crops as well. And this is also terraced, which is typical in, in uh, hilly um, or mountainous um, landscapes. Um, and here we see a slightly more close to home scenario. This is uh, Cultura Promisqua, which the Latin, the, the Romans um, kind of spread around the Mediterranean. This is Sicily in this case, which is my home uh, land. Um, terraced in this case, a bit of exposed soil, which uh, would, have, would have not been there depending on the on the management but essentially you have an interplay of olives fruit grapes cereals legumes vegetables all grown on the same small scale five acre farms and most of the work was done by hand um, so highly diversified natural looking adapted to the landscape using also uh, the slope for microclimate and water management so you know this is something that was done even in western cultures um, in the past before mechanization um, so the english forest garden and the work uh, to introduce this to the West, as, you know, to, to adapt it to, to our modern culture was done by Martin Crawford, David Jackie, and even before um, uh, these people, um, Robert Hart in England. Um, these forest gardens are called English because they've developed in England mainly, but um, they, 
the temperate forest gardens, very different from tropical or subtropical ones. Um, and you can see uh, that this is a mature one. There are a lot of crops here which are not very common, not things that you would necessarily use as foods in your diet. And this is one of the features of these gardens is that you plant them and they have a, um, a, a successional dynamics, but they go towards a young forest look. They will look and feel and produce like a young forest. And this means that there won't be very many, very many vegetables. There will be some fruit, also a lot of unusual crops, leafy crops of fruits of tubers and roots and things like that and herbs, but not necessarily the ones that we are adapted to in our uh, diet, which is full of annuals, unfortunately. So these systems uh, have got at least this drawback, um, and uh, but they've got also a lot of benefits. Obviously, they create beautiful uh, wildlife habitat, beautiful environments to be in. They look so natural. They look like a forest. And obviously, we respond um, psychologically and hormonally to that environment. It's a beautiful space to be in. And here you see a more Mediterranean example in the, in Bulgaria. You have Mediterranean herbs and you have nitrogen fixing broom here, a fennel as a vegetable, and then you have pepper tree as a very high crop, which is still young. Then you have some uh, Jerusalem martichokes in the in the background, a grapevine. And if you zoom out, you see all the fruit trees, the mulberries, the quinces, the elderberries, the cherries, the medlars. And then you see also how this type of system, forest gardening again, is being managed in a in a very informal or very naturalistic way there are some areas which are more adaptable for vegetables than be used for vegetables and so there's more light and less trees here there's more areas which are more like um, an orchard but they're all in the same small scale and there are also beds which are um, mixed or interplanted with perennials and annuals like this one and so the forest garden has got this naturalistic feel to it it's also flexible in the way you use the space it's not modular or systematic but it's got also some drawbacks when you're looking at production because obviously this is how it looks you know in the initial phases very bright there's a lot of light coming in this is again in devon martin crawford's um one of martin crawford's sites uh, there's some walnut but all the fr fruit trees or nut trees or other trees are still very small and so they don't produce they don't cause a lot of shading uh, and so there's space for growing vegetables. Now, these are mostly herbaceous and, and fruit shrubs and other things, but one could have systematic, uh, um, you know, uh, type of uh, bed design, uh, growing vegetables in between the trees, like we'll see in a minute. But um, there is enough light, there is enough space to grow vegetables. So it's not a big deal. But in time, this system will become more like this. So long term, this is again, Martin Crawford's one of the oldest, uh, most mature forest gardens that he's developed in Devon, in Dartington. And look at how much shade there is in there. You can grow, yes, you can grow lemon balm, but there aren't very many vegetables you can grow here, especially in the shoulder seasons, autumn and spring especially autumn when the leaves of the trees are still on and you know you wouldn't be able to grow very many vegetables here because the vegetables we grow have been adapted and selected and borrowed from climates where there is a lot of light and so this is a problem that we want to overcome by adapting this concept uh, to something that's more flexible and more suitable for vegetable production the obvious idea is uh, alley cropping so this interplay of different layers and different functions can happen on a line. So you separate the line on which the trees are and the shrubs are and all the perennials are from the line on which the vegetables, sorry, the vegetables and the arable crops or whatever you want to grow the animals are. And this uh, looks a bit like that. This is obviously what's done in silver arable cases with arable crops. Uh, so here we have rapeseed, here we have uh, sweet cherry and uh, sweet cherry, sorry, and willow and uh, grazing underneath. Here we have hazel coppice at Wakelins in Norfolk in the UK. And in between there is some uh, cereals. And he, this is more towards what we're interested in actually here in this video. This is a Schillingford, our neighbours and friends uh, in Exeter. They have vegetable growing uh, between in alleys between fruit trees. Now these alleys are very far apart actually. So you, here you only see one. Um, and we'll discuss about the distance between the alleys in a minute. Uh, but um, they, they grow vegetables, vegetables in between. And the fact that the rows of perennials and the um, vegetable area are separated makes it for much easier management, not only in terms of light, space, but also if you have to use machinery in between, if you have to do any pruning or harvesting of the fruit, it's all uh, kind of limited to one area. So it's very functional in terms of workflow, space management. Also in time, it will be easier because you can kind of offset when you do the, the work in the field here and when you do the work on the rows. Um, the other advantage is that you can transform an alley cropping system into a silver pastoral one because you can at some point decide to convert the alley to grazing rather than to production of crops. And here there are other systems which show 
again, uh, crops, potatoes, I think, in this case. I can't really see what these are. And, uh, and in this case, this is... Um, uh, this is cereals, barley being grown uh, in between alleys of willow for wood chip. Uh, and again, this is another system uh, in France and in England. Um, and these are uh, wheat poplar, I believe, uh, which is grown uh, and uh, a cereal in between. And the poplar is for timber. So you can see that this system is really not what we want. There's very little diversity here. There's only one species. Um, and this crop is tillage based, so you, you would have to come in there, till the ground, harvest it, combine it. So there's a big machinery going in, uh, disturbance of the soil. There's only one crop here and one crop there, so very low diversity. Um, the temporal component is not huge uh, because obviously this is a very, you know, relatively large scale system. So um, everything needs to be efficient and systematized. Um, so we are more interested in system like systems towards this end where you have. A tree row which has got a lot of fruit vegetables and shrubs and things like that and a lot of vegetables in between so fruit crops um, and vegetables so high diversity in the line on the agroforestry row and high diversity in between in the alley um, the benefit of having silver arable systems that have been studied is that we have a lot of data on them and I'm, i want to point towards two interesting factors here um, and these are features that we want in our systems, whether or not they're big scale or not, or intensive or not. So this is the poplar uh, wheat um, interplanting, or agroforestry alley cropping. And you have the poplar, so this is the complementarity of the light use in the two crops. So the poplar uses a lot of light in the winter, in the, sorry, in the autumn, and then it loses its leaves and it recovers again its canopy in summer. Uh, so the wheat has got a lot of time, this is winter wheat, to grow in spring without any shade or with limited shade. And then in the summer it gets a little bit of shading towards the tail end of the season, but that's fine. And that's when the poplar does most of its um, photosynthesizing. So the two, the, the offset between these two peaks with these two mounds shows that the light is being used by both crops in an efficient way. So even though both the yields might be reduced uh, by the interaction, you have two yields from the same area. So individual crops will produce perhaps a little bit better in monoculture situations, but the interaction of the two makes uh, makes it so that uh, the same square meter produces a lot more um, uh, food or timber because you have two crops in the place of one. So if you adapt this two mounds, essentially you get optimal use of light. This is a very interesting graph. This shows how the uh, yield of the wheat is affected by uh, two things, time, year from the tree planting, and also the distance between the uh, the rows, so the width of the alley. For very wide alleys, that would be 40 meters. Uh, you have a very slow effect uh, as the trees grow and mature. And for very tight alleys, for very narrow alleys, you have a more dramatic effect. Um, so the yields go down significantly. Now, you have to bear in mind that this is a temperate climate in which light is a huge limiting factor. This is England, so relatively high latitude. And also these systems are not regenerative as such. Uh, these are organic systems, but um, there is tillage in between. There's a monocrop in between and a monocrop here. So this is an interplanting, so it's actually a polyculture, but it's a polyculture of only two crops, so very low diversity. And there is root pruning. Um, uh, so um, it has been decided that to avoid competition, there, there is subsoiling happening every one or two years, I believe, along the boundary of this row so that the, cro the roots of the poplars don't go into the alley. And also there's tillage in between. So there's very little mycorrhizal populations happening there. Now, some people believe that that's a good thing. The fact that the roots of the trees cannot interfere with the roots of the crop. But some people believe the opposite, that the interaction of the roots of the trees with the roots of the crop are very beneficial because the mycorrhizal network that establishes and it's perennialized, naturalized in the tree row can benefit and create a network of exchange of water, nutrients, microbial populations, hormones, um, especially when we prune the, the trees also for the crops. So it becomes the microorganisms and it works It works uh, holistically. Now, there isn't enough evidence that this is true. Uh, this is what uh, we are going to um, work on uh, under the assumption that there is an element of that. We have seen evidence, anecdotal evidence of this, but there's very little data showing that there is collaboration, cooperation, more than competition. In this climate, in this setup, they did see, uh, sorry, some competition and it could be changed by widening the the alleys but that's not what would happen necessarily in a tropical climate these distances would be very different because shading is a good thing when you have a lot of sunlight 
especially in summer. Um, this shows slightly less important, relevant for us uh, statistics. It shows that uh, the tree heights and trunk diameters of different trees uh, grown in agroforestry is different, are different when, when they're grown um, in, in forestry situations. So monocrop, monocrop or forestry situation versus agroforestry. And uh, depending on the density also, you get different, uh, different widths and, and heights and diameters. So there seems to be an optimal um, uh, you, an, opti uh, an optimal um, situation here uh, after a few years uh, for um, the woodland case scenario and that's only weakly shown in the agroforestry of ash in this case but that's just to show you that in different situations you get different uh, yields and in this case um, the woodland um, mixed woodland is the brown one it's the most productive but then the agroforestry of ash is more productive, for example, of a natural woodland with sycamore. Well, natural, that's not the right word, but a forestry situation. So agroforestry can compete very well in terms of timber and uh, wood chip and, 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 and all sorts of production uh, from the trees. And this is the, the, um, um, the trunk diameter, I think. And uh, again, we see in this case, the ash agroforestry is actually a lot better than the woodland. So agroforestry scores really well in terms of wood production. Um, and, and so you might argue, even in these systems which are not regenerative, that the um, loss, of, loss of production in the crop in between the trees, which you know might not happen, but in this system happened, uh, can more than be compens that can be more than compensated by the increase in production in terms of the tree or timber crop. Right, but let's move on to something we are more interested in, which is how do we incorporate the elements of agroforestry? which I've called hortoforestry uh, or silver horticultural agroforestry to market gardens. So this is the market garden we have here in, um, uh, we've managed in the last three years here in Devon in the UK. You can see there are no tree crops there, but it seems like a system that would adapt very easily to an agroforestry uh, element. So here we have, for example, the only agroforestry element actually we have is a coppice of willow here, which we use as a windbreak and for wood chip production and in, interplanted with herbs. But there is no, you know, combined element. You would argue from here to here is 50 meters, so you could put another row of trees here and make it look like a large-scale agroforestry system. But I've seen the interaction of the willow only with the very first few beds here, both in terms of competition and in terms of stimulation. Um, and you can see this is documented in our videos on the channel uh, under the pulse effect or syntropic um, interplanting uh, titles. Um, essentially, we would like to incorporate in a market garden like this some perennial element which can um, serve different uh, purposes. One would be it can create shade because in Italy where we are in summer vegetable crops believe it or not believe it or not need shade to grow well um, and so people usually use shade cloth uh, instead of insect me mesh or even on tunnels they use um, insect uh, sorry shade cloth to shade crops and improve production. In our case we would like that shade to be provided by trees and to be flexible and depending on, on the pruning we can do. Uh, and also we would like to produce soft fruit and top fruit and we would like to produce a lot of biomass within our systems. And perennials are the best candidates for biomass because every year they start from their roots. They don't start from scratch like vegetables. And so we can produce biomass, fruit, um, shade, and obviously have a microorganism with roots all over the place, exchanging nutrients, exchanging microbes, exchanging uh, stimuli and everything. How do we do that? So there are some challenges, obviously. The main challenge that you can see straight away is space management. We don't. We want to be able to manage the shade so that it, there isn't too much of it or too little of it. We want to be able to ma manage biomass. Uh, so if we can limit the amount of material we have to import in terms of uh, mulch, um, in our case compost, but it could be anything, hay, straw, can we actually uh, replace it with whatever we grow in the perennial rows or lanes? Um, that access, obviously trees present some access difficulties and workflow, having to prune and harvest the trees in between the vegetables, is it going to be easy or not? And then we have time management, obviously, you will have to harvest an, another crop, you have to keep in mind that there is succession dynamics to manage, <coughs> so some vegetables might grow better earlier in this type of system, but worse later, you have to adapt this, depending on what your markets are, and then obviously there's time involved in harvesting and pruning and then market stream diversification so there's no point having an extra type of crop like fruit trees um, 
um, shrubs and other things or plants you know you could even be selling perennial plants and cuttings and things like that if you don't have a market for those things and then obviously the elephant in the room is there is a long-term financial investment now uh, this is going to cost us quite a bit of money to implement all the all these agroforestry systems which is our own money we're not getting any grants for anybody uh, mainly because that's the way we like to do it but also because we want to do it quickly without waiting uh, for grants to come around and, and without waiting for uh, and, and without listening to what um, you know the grant um, uh, rules might be we would like to do things freely and but this will involve a cost and in most case scenarios this cost doesn't get repaid uh, after until after only you know a, a few years at least but it might be a long term because the fruit trees won't produce in year one and also there is a lot of labor going in in the first few years in for planting and for pruning etc et which will not uh, necessarily be paid back until there is a production uh, and finally we have to be able and this is what i'm going to focus in the rest of this video on adapting existing models to our local climate and um, uh, now i'm going to go through different types of models of agroforestry and we will see what we can borrow from those models and apply it to our to our context 